Hi. Trolley-style problems present us with a choice between following a consistent principle or departing from that principle, or in this particular case, in order to generate a better outcome. So balance between rule following and maximizing good outcomes. Immanuel Kant anticipated this type of objection against his rule-based ethics by raising explicitly the case of the inquiring murderer. And he gives the answer that, yes, you must always, under all circumstances, tell the truth, even to the inquiring murderer. In this video, I'd like to summarize briefly the inquiring murderer example. I'd like to explain what I think are two lines of reasoning behind Kant's seemingly impossible answer to this question, and then give an example that I hope will make Kant's position a little bit more understandable to us, even if, in the end, we disagree with it still. So first, what is the case of the inquiring murderer? Well, Kant writes in a short essay that we should imagine that we are sitting at our home, let's imagine in our apartment, and we hear footsteps go down the hall, we look out and see somebody enter the apartment next door, and followed immediately around somebody coming around the corner holding an ax. The murderer knocks on our door, stops us, and says, with obvious intent to murder the fellow who just ran by, he asks, where is he hiding? Now, I know the answer to this question, and I can at this point either answer truthfully, he went into the apartment next door, or falsely, I indicate some other place that he might have gone or conceal the knowledge that I have. And we might think, thinking about this particular case, in this case, if no other, we would be justified in telling a lie to someone. We would be justified in concealing our knowledge of the truth because it's very obvious that this person means no good and that telling the truth will, in short order, very predictably lead to the death of an innocent person. So Kant says no, that the nature of moral duty is such that we must tell the truth to the inquiring murderer. Uh, we can't ex give ourselves a sort of get out of doing your duty for free card by appealing to our philanthropic intentions, to our desire to benefit people to produce good outcomes. As I said before, many people take this as an example that there's something badly wrong with Kant's process of moral reasoning, because this looks like a case where it is obvious that the answer is to break the normally uh, binding rule about truth-telling. And I think Kant can respond in two ways. Uh, one, one line of reasoning that I think leads to his conclusion uh, is based upon the nature of moral duty itself. And Kant might ask us, do I have a specifically moral obligation to tell the truth? That is, is this a, a question of morality and not just of social practice or getting by? If we agree that my duty to tell the truth is a moral duty, then the nature of moral duty itself, Kant would say, answers the question for us because it is in the character of moral duties to be categorical, to apply under all circumstances. So it's not possible for me to admit a moral duty and then find myself exceptions to it in specific cases where I think I might be able to do better for the world or for other people or for myself by departing from the rule. Now, I realize this just pushes the issue back one level to ask, what is the character of a moral duty and why is it categorical? That's a question answered in Kant's more detailed moral philosophy. But I think that's his first line of reasoning, which is that if we're talking about morality, we are talking about rules to which there can be no uh, situational exceptions. If we disagree about that, we disagree perhaps about the very nature of duty itself. We might be challenged then to offer an alternate account of duty, uh, but more on that perhaps later in another video. The second line of reasoning, I think, is very fascinating. Kant spends a little bit of detail on this in the essay. Um, he talks about responsibility for consequences. And I think one of the interesting contrasts between our approach today and Kant's approach to this question is that we tend to evaluate the issue, I think, assigning equal weight, equal responsibility for consequences to both the choice to tell the truth and the choice to lie. So if I choose to tell the truth and the murderer kills his victim, I am somehow responsible for that very foreseeable and inevitable outcome of my truth-telling, whereas if I lie, I also am somehow responsible 
for the outcome of that lie. Here, I would anticipate telling a lie to the murderer would delay or prevent his committing the murder. And that would then be a good consequence that I brought about. I would achieve a kind of positive responsibility for that. Kant, I think, disagrees with exactly that, e that equality. He seems to argue that if I tell the truth, then I am in no way morally accountable for the consequences that follow from my truth telling. I can say to anybody who asks me afterwards, I did my duty. I did what I was obligated to do by the moral law. In this sense, I, I think Kant would say, I did my duty is an absolute blanket defense against any negative consequences that follow. Because if I did my duty, nobody could reasonably have expected me to do anything other than my duty. They can't hold up some other thing I should have done and said, you should have done this instead in preference to your duty. In some ways, this is, this is related to the, the previous line of thought about categorical moral, the categorical force of moral duties. On the other hand, Kant would say, if I lie, I have now departed from duty. I no longer have that kind of umbrella protection from responsibility for outcomes. Now I do, in a sense, own the outcome of my lie, whatever it turns out to be. Now, I, I tell the lie because I'm anticipating a good outcome, but it is possible that there'll be a bad outcome to my lie. And Kant says, I suppose that my while I was detained talking with the inquiring murderer, the victim, in fact, in the apartment next door has climbed out the window and then climbed in through my bedroom window along the fire escape and is now in my apartment. So if I, thinking that I'm very clever and humanitarian, tell a lie and say to the murderer, no, he's in here, he's in my bedroom, come on in and spend a lot of time searching for him, the murderer will go in and, to my great surprise, discover his victim and kill him there. Now, in that case, I do share responsibility for the murderer for the murder. If I had done anything other than tell that lie, if I had commit, if I, if I had stuck to my duty, I would be blameless. In this case, the victim has died. And now I am responsible because I'm the one who sent the killer after him, not, not intending it, not thinking that that was what I was doing. So Kant seems to insist that there is this profound asymmetry in the type of responsibility that I acquire. If I perform my duty, I am not responsible for the outcome. I can just say, I did my duty, and everybody will say, but fine, you did your duty. That's, that, that's how duty works. If I depart from my duty, now all bets are off. I have to own and take responsibility both for the positive and for the negative outcomes of the choice that I've made. Lastly, let me give you an example of a situation that I think will make Kant's position a little bit more intelligible. Suppose I am a sailor on a naval vessel in the Pacific during World War II. I'm an American sailor, a very low ranking one, like assistant mechanic. And I'm on a battleship and my duty station, when we get into combat, let's imagine this is the Battle of Coral Sea, my duty station is to man a particular pump below decks. This pump comes on and functions automatically. My job as assistant mechanic, my duty is to make sure this pump doesn't break. And if it breaks, to get it back online as soon as possible. Now, this is not a very glorious duty to have, especially when the outcome of the, of the battle and of the war might hinge upon what each person does. But it is my duty. It's what I've been assigned to do, and there's nothing else within my duty uh, station for me to do. Now, it may come about that during the battle, as things develop on the ship, I can see opportunities that I might be able to take. Right? Maybe there's short one ammunition reloader on deck. If only I were there, I could help feed ammunition to the guns faster. There's something else I could do, you know, bailing out some other section of the ship. But each of these would require me to abandon my duty station, to leave this pump unmanned. I could choose to neglect my duty and go do something else. And maybe I would be the glorious hero of the battle. They would say, well, he was the guy who helped us to fire the guns in time. Or he was the guy who helped bail out that section and save some lives. But on the other hand, it may not. It may be that this pump breaks while I'm absent. And if the pump breaks when I've abandoned my duty station, I am, we can see, a very, um, very grievously responsible both for the breakdown and for whatever happens. God help me if the ship sinks because I wasn't there to man that particular pump. That was my duty. If I stay at my duty station, as I am obligated to do as a sailor who's been given his duty, 
if things happen and you know there's we, we were short one uh one gunner or we didn't have enough people bailing out those things in a sense are not really my my fault my responsibility because i say look i had the pump demand that's what i did i did my duty i say quite quite literally so i think that that way of thinking about a sailor doing his duty and therefore not being responsible for whatever bad consequences happen from his failing to depart from it because the duty is what he's supposed to do what he has to do versus the sailor who leaves his duty station and therefore becomes responsible for the good and the bad outcomes of what happens there's a sense in which i think kant is not necessarily saying that that consequences are irrelevant he's saying that responsibility for consequences doesn't even become a factor if one does one's duty that is the absolute first and foremost priority for any moral agent for any moral actor so that's a, a quick look at uh, some of my thoughts about the case of the inquiring murderer uh, feel free to ask comments or uh, to ask questions in the comments section below or make suggestions for other videos i hope you've enjoyed this one thanks for watching today goodbye